High in the mountains of northern New Mexico, between Santa Fe and Taos, lies a most unique land. These are the villages held in the embrace of La Jicarita Mountain, small enclaves settled by Pueblo Indians and Spanish and Mexican explorers centuries ago. Today, the descendants of settlers, explorers, and indigenous people of southern Taos County live here in harmony with the traditions and customs passed down from generation to generation a proud people whose roots are deep in the land they love and have a foothold in both the modern world and the history of their rich culture and heritage. These are the people of the Rio Lucio, Chamasaw, and many other small villages surrounding Penasco, New Mexico. Hello, okay, I'm Eloida Roybal Romero, and um, first I want to congratulate all people who have started these Culturas de Celebración. It has really inspired a lot of people, and it seems to be growing from last year. So I hope they do better as the years go by. Okay, I wrote, I'm the author of the Roybal Legacy, a book that took me about three years to put together. And what in inspired me to write the book, as I remember, was the name Roybal. I always used to say, it was spelled R-O-Y-B-A-L, and I always used to wonder, it didn't sound very much like a Spanish name, like the Martinez or Lucero, Trujillo. And I used to wonder, you know, and I asked my dad, he says, well, that's the way, you know, they said in Spain, they used to uh, call it Roybal, but, over here, maybe a priest, I'm saying that maybe a priest, they said Roy Ball, and he spelled it Roy and Ball, you know. And so it continued like that. So, okay, I started my book with the Indian Revolt of, 16, uh, of 1680. And the reason I started it at that time was because that's when Ignacio came over. Without the revolt, he probably would have never come to New Mexico. At the time, I guess the Indians felt that they were being mistreated, they were driven into slavery, and I guess they were getting tired, they couldn't practice their religion, and there were so many other things that finally drove them to revolt against the Spanish. So they finally revolted and drove everybody back to Mexico. And for 10 years, people lived over there, and they were afraid to come back, or they didn't, they didn't have a way to come. Nobody, a leader, strong enough to want to. Until uh, Diego de Vargas, 10 years later, decided he wanted to be the governor of New Mexico. So he talked to the king, and he, since he had the money, he decided he wanted to, so they lived. And, uh, but first he had to recruit people, enough people to come into New Mexico. So he wanted to, he went around Mexico recruiting, but he couldn't find enough. A lot of them still had bad memories about what had gone over here, and they didn't want to come back. So then he decided to go into Spain and recruit from Spain. And out of Spain came young guys, and out of this one came this Ignacio Raybal. He was just a young kid of 20, and he probably came with other, other young recruits from over there, and they had promised them a lot of uh, grants, that they would give them grants, and they would cut a lot of um, adventure a lot of adventure and all that, and uh, well, as a young guy, I guess they thought, oh well, it's probably good, you know, to leave Spain. But once they got here, they found out that there was no adventure fighting the Indians. So at the time when they, he finally arrived in Mexico and they were ready to come over here, they made the journey, nothing but men, all the soldiers that he had recruited, and they came 
into Santa Fe. When they got to Santa Fe, they stopped a short distance from there. They spotted, the Indians spotted them. By that time, all the Indians were living in all these royal houses that the Spanish people used to have, and they were living in them, and they were there. Also, there was one that used to be a Pampicuris. His name used to be Luis Tupatu, or something like that. He was a leader at that time, and he was living in Santa Fe, and he was the chief. And um, so when they saw him coming, well, they stopped him. A short distance, they stopped, and they said who they were, and they wanted to come and talk to them, and they wouldn't let him. Finally, after a long distance, he told them that they were calm, they would give him better treatment and all this. They finally, finally that Luis Tupatu and his, uh, and his brother walked over to where they were and they welcomed them. They told Mateo, okay, they would, okay. I'll just make it so it's easier and told them that they uh, they were welcome. So after that, they took them around to the Indian Pueblos and uh, they were baptizing. They had some, Indi uh, some Indian priests with them or priests with them. And they were going around to a different Pueblos baptizing and the Vargas was always on the lookout that they, they might make fire on them or something. But no, they treated them real nice. So after everything seemed like they were peaceful and everything, he decided to go back to Spain and recruit families to bring back to New Mexico. So he left with intentions that he would be coming within a year. So when he went back to Mexico, he recruited some families wanted to come back, some didn't and so. But after a year, he finally put some families together and they decided to come back. They were coming back. Well, this time, when they got back to said they there was rumors as they they would send a scout ahead to the Pueblos and there was rumors that uh, the Indians were not going to welcome them, that they had heard rumor, they were hearing rumors that they had gone back to Mexico to bring more soldiers and they were going to kill all the Indians and all these things went on. So they thought, oh, Oh my gosh, you know, we're going to have trouble. But when they got close to Santa Fe, yeah, they did not welcome them. They kept telling them that they would not, you know, that they uh, did not want them there. So they stayed like that and they finally settled on like a little hill and they made camp there. And they stayed there for a few weeks. And finally, when they found out that they weren't going to welcome them, they decided to go ahead and bring their. Uh, their equipment that they brought from over there, like their tanks and all that, they started throwing, uh, well, when the Indians started throwing rocks and arrows at them, then they knew it was time to start rebelling. So once they did, and finally when it was t time, you know, they, the Indians knew that they weren't going to win, then they finally gave up and welcomed them. And they came into the Santa Fe, and they even put a cross. They welcomed them again, and they put a cross there, like a peace cross. And uh, after that, they went around to the Indian Pueblos, but at one time or another, they started rebelling. The Indians started rebelling again, so they had to be simmering down. A lot of times they had to go into the Pueblos and burn down the Pueblos so that they would come out and and you know, give in, but it went on and on and uh, finally they, um, they subdued all the Indians and then they were able to put the families in Santa Fe. And, uh, well, uh, you know, what was okay, um, the, uh, what, uh, what Juan Diego promised them was better treatment, that it wouldn't be like the way they had done before, that there would be no more slavery, they would treat them good and all this. So it went on, and then they finally thought, I guess, that, you know, that they were going to be having a better time. So they, so anyway, after that, they uh, started giving grants out. And they gave Ignacio, he picked a little grant outside of Santa Fe. Uh, there was a grant there, and that's where he settled. By that time, he had gotten married. He had married a Gomez girl that came on the same trip that he came. And I guess he met her on the road somewhere along the, on the trip because they arrived here in Santa Fe 
in December. By February, they were married. So he must have met her on the road, and he had come from, she was from one of the Oñate families, prosperous families, because Ignacio came with nothing from Spain. He was just himself, you know, money, no nothing. But anyway, he decided to uh, petition and he got a little grand Santa Fe and he lived until he heard about this um, uh, Indian, it was an abandoned Indian Pueblo in Hakona. It's a little town going into Los Alamos. And he petitioned for that grant and he was given to he was given to him. Well then he was there where he built his house and he built it. Now that they're remodeling that house, they found out that there's two rooms made out of rock. So it could be that these rooms were made from the Indians when they were living there. And then he built with adobes and he made it like a 16 room home. Well, he prospered because he came from a prosperous family. The Gomez family were already well to do and they had gotten all their lands back. But of course, since he knew how to read and write, he also prospered. He bought more lands and he bought lands all over. By that time, he he, um, he became like a, um, oh, people that fixed the lands and all these for the people, you know, that when they give them grants and they have to put the border lines and all that, he became, and he also became sort of a policeman for the New Mexico. And, um, well, he raised nine kids in that house. He raised and he had all kinds of sheep and cows and he bought more properties with houses and more stock in them. So he prospered very well. By that time, he had his family, he had this son, and he had also bought all his values from Spain. Like uh, he bought, uh, he named his first, uh, the patron saint in Spain was Santiago. So when he had his first son, he named him Santiago. And uh, when, when he was growing up, he sent Santiago to Mexico to get educated over there. But when after he got educated, Santiago decided he wanted to be a priest. He didn't want to be, you know, another businessman or anything like this, that he wanted to be a priest. So he was the first born New Mexico priest that lived in New Mexico. Well, anyway, he prospered, and by the time he died, he had a lot of land. He left all kinds of money, but to his wife, he left, left the best of everything, you know. Anyway, okay, after they multiplied the nine kids, and they had to look for lands, and his dad gave them lands with houses, and then, well, of course, they multiplied, and they had to start looking for land elsewhere. At that time, by that time, um, there was this... Um, Pablo Roybal, and he had been living somewhere there, and he had eight kids. And he, I guess he heard about lands here in Peñasco that were up for, you know, that they could uh, homestead. And he decided, I guess, to come up and check out himself anyway. I guess there was, must have been a lot of land right there in Llano de San Juan, because uh, after he moved over here, and I found out uh, from, um, uh, you know, when they do the census, that he, they lived in Yano, that they lived in Yano, and all his brothers and everybody lived out there. His children started living in, in Yano until finally somebody, they started spreading into Peñasco and to Rio Lucio, and Chamisal, some of them went to Chamisal. So that's when um, they started, so, from then on, then I talk about Peñasco. He came with his eight children and they lived in uh, Llanes San Juan. And uh, from there, he must have brought a lot of, maybe uh, home, maybe they used to get a, a lot of like machinery and things like that from Missouri already in Santa Fe. So when he came, I guess he already came a well to do men with all kinds of machinery that he used to farm and all that and he prospered. Eventually, some of the children moved to Peñasco and they started getting uh, 
more land. I know that my grandfather and his brother, they bought a lot of land in Peñasco. All this land over here where we're sitting now up to the road and up to where the station is that belonged to his brother. The other side of the road, my grandfather had all that land over there, all the way down to where, uh, almost by the church. Mm -hmm. And then on the otra banda that they call over there, he had all that land there and clear across the road and clear almost so to the mountain. So he had prospered, he had good land. But then what happened, he died. He, when my dad was about, my dad says he was to be about nine years old and he passed away, he got sick. They used to take him to Mora. He used to accumulate a lot of water on his knees and he had a lot of complications. So he finally didn't make it and he died. Well, after that, my grandma, she didn't know anything. My grandpa was the one that was business. At one time, he had a bar in Chamisal, and he used to go and come. Then he put a store in the house where he lived, and uh, he sold things like that that they used to bring from Santa Fe or whatever, and this is what he lived on, and he did exchange jobs and things like that for people. But he really lived off the land. I remember my dad saying, my dad and my Tio Pablo that lived in this area right here where we're sitting, he said they never used to go for wood. They always paid somebody to bring them wood and all that. So I guess they were well to do. But after my grandpa died, my grandma just didn't know how to do all she did. All she knew what to do was to live off the farm that she had. So she really didn't send the kids to school. My dad says, forget it, he, he was to send me to school maybe one day or two days, and then the next two days, my brother would go to school. The next two days, I had to stay home and take care of the sheep, take them up to the mountains, and, and uh, and my brother would go to school, and then my dad says, and then the school were not that good then. He says the teacher talked in Spanish and says, and if you went to school and you misbehaved, my dad said they would put you in the corner in a little piece of wood, and uh, they'd have you kneeling the rest of the day. So he says, so what could you learn? Why didn't they just make you read a book, you know? Take a book home and read it and bring it back the next day. Oh, but sit in the corner, you weren't gonna learn. And then the next day, maybe my, grand, my mother wouldn't send him to, he said my mother wouldn't send me back to school. Another punishment that my dad remembers was, he says, did they cut you chewing gum? He said, oh, the teacher was, he used to say his, uh, Homer was the name of the teacher. He says he was a uh, mean teacher. He says, if he cut you chewing gum, he, he used to put you over there on the window with your gum against that window there. He, and you couldn't move. He, that was punishment. That was hard. He, you had to stand there with that gum and you couldn't move. You know, you had to stick with that gum on the thing. He, so, Schools were not that good. I mean, what were you going to learn? And then the other times, you, my, my mother didn't send me to school, so times were hard. Even my dad, so it's not like my dad would talk about his brother, the one that lived in the Pablo, and uh, he would say, uh, uh, he would say that uh, that they went. He sent his kids to school in Taos, and uh, you probably knew my Tio Cosmes that used to have a bar down the street. Well, he learned how to read and write and he knew how to do the business and he ran a bar. And then uh, his other, uh, he had a daughter, Delfinia. He sent her to school and she became a teacher from the eighth grade, but she taught school here in Peñasco. And then Amau Rival, the one that built the theater, well, he went to work in Santa Fe and worked for theater and learned the English and came and built a theater. So my dad said, oh, my cousins prospered because they had their father, you know, who was more distant, but my mother didn't even send us to school. So my dad said, well, she was a good mother, but I mean, times were hard, you know. And so that's the way they lived until, uh, and times were hard, to, you know, the times were hard, there was no roads, the roads were bad, the people had to depend on horses, even after cars started coming. My dad said, there's many a times when they would come for me to with, get my horses and go pull the car out, you know, where he was stuck. So you know, it was just the, this though, you went to Taos, it took you forever, going around that Dixon Hill, Ooh, you, know, you had to honk before, you know, or whistle before because the roads were so curvy and you were afraid somebody else was coming the other way. And so that's the way Peñasco was at one time. 
you know, it was very isolated. The things coming in from Missouri were hard to get and people had to make do with hard tools and work the hard way. And well, eventually things got a little better. As time, I remember when I was in school, when I was in school and uh, well, we went to school and by that time, thank God, this, priest had bought nuns to Peñasco, so we learned, they, we learned how to read, how to, they taught us religion, they taught us everything, and uh, they were strict, but you have to be grateful for that, because that was the only way that you, that we learned, and uh, so I remember, you know, little things that the nuns would do, but, you know, we, uh, and I talk in my book about the priests, about our churches, about the schools, about just different things that happened, you know. But, um, and we didn't even have electricity. I still remember, oh, this is, I, I remember we didn't have electricity. And when electricity, electricity came by in the 50s, sometime in the 50s, well, I know that we weren't one of the first families, you know, to put electricity here and there, somebody was saving money and putting electricity. Finally, I remember that they, my mom said, we wanted to buy something, I said, no, we're saving so we can put electricity, okay. Well, finally, I guess they put the money together and they went and called somebody to put electricity. Well, when they put electricity, oh, we just were so happy, you know, here we had light and all that, but then we didn't have no appliances or nothing. <laughs> And we had a car. I still remember, and I, we laugh about it today. I still remember that we had a car, and uh, we wanted, my mom wanted an iron, so she wouldn't have to this day. We wanted our radio. We wanted, uh, we had a radio on the window, but we wanted something that we could move. We wanted an electric clock. We didn't want to have to be winding that clock every night. So I remember, and I think about it, and I said, we got all, the whole family went to Taos. We all piled like the hillbillies, you know, going to, going to Taos. And uh, so I remember when we went over there, we, oh, we got a radio. We got a, um, what do you got? We even got a toaster. And we, we didn't even have bread, you know, but I convinced my mom to buy a loaf of bread, you know, <laughs> so we could make some toast and we probably end and we probably ate the whole bread that same day you know because we didn't never had bread we always ate was tortillas so we oh we were so happy we went and hanged the clock and we didn't have to why we put the radio in the kitchen we used to have it in the window in the bedroom and my mother was more happy with her iron and uh, oh I, I remember I felt like we were rich if I ever felt like I was rich, that was one time we came home and oh my God, we were listening to that radio. My mom was so happy with her iron. We had the clock up in the wall and like that. But times went like that. But as, um, but we did, we were poor. But I guess in a way we were rich because we did live in a small farm. My dad had a ranch up in Llano, but we had a little, but an acre right there around the house. And uh, we had a garden. We always had a garden. My mom always made a garden. And I still remember they always planted corn, they always planted corn. And I still remember they had an orno that they had built. And uh, when it was time the corn was ready, they would go and my dad and my mom would get in the gunny sack, all the corn there, and he would put it by the sequia. Every two hours he would go get a bucket of water from the sequia and keep them moist. He would keep all that corn moist. And then when the sun went down, he would make a big fire in the orno. He would make a big old fire until it was so hot. And then he took all the ashes and he dumped all those uh, corn into the orno and sealed it. They would seal it, put a blanket and the chimney was sealed and everything. The next morning, about seven o'clock, all the neighborhood kids and some of my neighbors would come over and we'd have, that was our breakfast. He would put like what they called, um, uh, they used to call them, I don't know, um, burros. They used to put burros and then a, a big old board there. We'd all sit there and eat corn to our lives. And um, they would bring out the coffee for the grown ups, but we had corn and we had corn and then it was happy. After that, I remember they would take the husks off and then they had to wind them with a string and all that and they would hang them up in the line and uh, and then take them down at night, but whatever, whenever, um, 
Well, it depended on the weather. Sometimes if it was sunny, maybe two weeks, three weeks, and the corn would be ready for shikos. And then after that, after we ate supper, my dad would sit us all around that cajete, like a tub. And uh, we had to take all the little shikos out of the things, and then my mom would save them in a flour sack, and we used to use those for beans, or she'd make them with meat, or whatever. So that was one of the commodities that we had that we always ate. Another thing, we had chickens. So with the chickens, it was my job to feed the chickens and my job to close the little gate at the end of the day so that, you know, they would uh, until the next day. But I remember it was my job. The boys had to shop wood. They had to bring in the wood. They had to bring in the water. But uh, my job was the chickens. So when, and I had to bring in the eggs too. But when the chickens were laying, we always had eggs for scrambled eggs or my mom would make a cake or she'd make bizcochitos or there was always something that she would use the eggs for. And then uh, also another thing we had, um, oh, we had a cow. And when at one time we had a Jersey cow, and I remember my mom was the only one that would milk that cow. So during that time when the when the, the cow had a little calf, well, the milk was good, and our Jersey always had, so we always had like a lot of uh, milk. We always had milk. My mom was forever making cheese, quesos that they say, yeah. And uh, we would eat with jelly, with uh, miel, and uh, it was just, uh, you know, times where in a way we were poor, but I guess we didn't even know we were that poor. And, um, and then, of course, we had, oh, we had pigs. <laughs> had pigs, and they always fattened one for November. And I still remember those matanzas, you know. I still once in a while crave to go to one, you know. But I remember at home, my dad was good at that. Even after my mom died, and he always had his uh, dagger sh sharpened. Once in a while, somebody would call him and wanted him to go kill a cow or a pig or something. He always used to have meat. At one time, we even got him a fish. After we were all away from home, we even shipped in, all the kids shipped in and bought him an upright freezer. So when people gave him meat, he would just stick it in there and save it for us when we came home. But the matanzas were good. I mean, you know, the... They would kill it and then they would make a fire and warm up by the sequia with a sequia ready in back of our house, so it was no problem. And the men would always skin the pig and they would make jokes. And I remember the joking, and then the women were inside the house making the meat and chicharrones and so by pias. And oh my God, they made a day out of it. And after they went home, everybody took a piece of meat. And everybody went home with a piece of meat, and still, I guess, you know, it multiplied. We still had meat. My mom would make dry jerky or dry meat out of the meat. And uh, so we always had meat in the winter, dry meat, too, from this, because there was no freezer, so we couldn't... Uh, Later, I remember my dad came home with a little freezer. It wasn't even a big freezer. It was one of those, like a box freezers, and you had to buy the ice, but it was good enough for us. My mom kept the food in there, and we were happy. So that's what life was like with a garden. We always had uh, carrots and peas and onions, and my mom always made calabacita with corn. So, you know, at times where this day, hard, but I mean, we we had something to eat. And then my mom would dry a lot out, she would make a lot of jelly, so we always had enough for the winter too. And uh, and then later the National Forest, times got better a little time after the National Forest formed the, what did they used to call them, the um, Tortugas or something? Tortugas or something. It was a, a see. It was a, a name for the, all the destos, and so they had to go to training. And my dad joined. So after that, he used to go to California or California. He said it paid the best. He would go to Montana, and he would come home with all kinds of stories of where they had gone and all this and that. But then. In between, my mom passed away. She used to have high blood pressure and living on the farm, I guess. She really didn't go to the doctor all the time. They had to go all the way to Taos. And uh, I guess she didn't really, you know, take it serious. Anyway, she had, uh, one day she had a stroke. 
and uh, she was only 47, but she passed away. And after that, it just like, uh, I mean, it just like tore the family apart. I was the oldest one, so I was the one that had to be responsible for doing the laundry. I had to do the food. I did everything around the house. They all depend. I was the only grown-up girl. My sister was little, too. And, uh, but it was times were a little better then, you know. But at that time, you know, parents didn't pay too much attention about education, about saving money to send you to college. Maybe some parents did, but I know mine didn't. I know a lot of other parents just barely made it, you know, so they didn't think of putting up money to send your kid to college. So, okay, well, after I graduated, uh, then I went to this, day, but my dad stayed on and my sister stayed on at the house. It was hard for my sister too, because, you know, without a mother to take care of her and all that, and I did the best I could come in sometimes to the summers to paint and things like that. But, well, time went on and, uh, and you know, I mean, uh, let's see what I was gonna say about my dad, about, Anyway, like this day, my dad used to save a lot of meat for us and when we came and all that. I remember that one time people need, didn't want the head. He'd kill a pig and they didn't want the liver, they didn't want this and the head. And one time we were gonna come to Penasco and I told my dad, we're going and he said, just bring some tortillas and red chili. And I said, well, what for, you know? But when he came, he had this big head, a pig's head in the oven and he took it out and he put it on top of the table and I warmed the chili. Oh, what a meal, you know, that meat, you just took it out of the head and it was so good, you know. It was just so good that, oh my gosh, after that I used to tell him, save all those heads when people don't want them. And, and I guess I bragged about it when I went back to Albuquerque because I remember, I guess I told my mother-in-law and one time she called me to work and she tells me, and she tells me, what are you gonna do after work? And I said, well, I'm just going home. She says, come over to the house. I have something for you. So I went over to her house and sure enough, she had a big old head. Well, she had bought one for her and she had the tortillas and the chili and she did it just for me. <laughs> I guess I really, but it was good, you know. But then in, as time went on, then my brothers and we all moved to Albuquerque and my dad and after that, he had a, um, uh, he got, he, okay, this is something that, we, you know, it was hard for him. He found himself alone after he was alone. He found, I know he went to drinking, you know. He took up drinking and with his friends and this and that. And I used to tell him, if you keep on drinking, I'm going to take you to Albuquerque. So he would stop probably for all because he didn't want to go to Albuquerque. But then when he finally did, and then he lost his leg with his drinking, you know, he didn't pay attention to it. And when I took him to a doctor, he had gangrene and they had to take his leg off and uh, so it was so it was one of those things but you know what it was just I don't know they say uh, God sometimes intervenes you know because after that he never drank again he never and he took care of his diet and he but he wanted to come back to Peniasco so we brought him back to Peniasco and then later on, he got sick again. You know, he, his, his uh, lower back was falling apart. His heart was slowing down. So when we took him to Albuquerque, I knew he couldn't come back. So I told him, you're gonna have to live with us, Dad, you know. But he always wanted to come back to Peñasco. I said, when it's spring, we'll go back to Peñasco and I'll stay with you. We'll stay over there a month and then we'll come back. And uh, oh, how he loved Peñasco, oh my God. We had my son-in-law, Norman, and every time he went to Penasco, I mean, to Albuquerque, he always wanted to know all the news, all the news. <laughs> and you know, another thing too, uh, when he got sick and he was in the hospital, he got a letter from, uh, from your dad, what, Alfredo Romero. I still have that letter. He had the most beautiful writing. And he used to consider my dad a friend. I guess my dad had worked as a janitor at the, at the high school, and they became like friends. And I still remember when he got sick, he wrote him a letter. And I, today I still have that letter, but I kept it because of the beautiful writing, you know? <laughs>
<laughs> and so on. So my dad finally passed away. And one tradition that we had, whenever my dad went, we always gathered to have my dad with. He always went for Christmas, and we stayed with, and he stayed with one family and then the other, like that. So we started... Uh, having like a dinner when he, he stayed with me I it was dinner at my house everybody came and all the children everybody but I had I made the main meal and the children my brothers and sisters always brought something else and we all gathered together and uh, we did that and then the next day was my sisters the next day and my brothers and we rotated and to today my dad's been gone about close to 30 years, and we still have kept that culture. We still get together every year in different houses, and we always talk about my dad and things like that, but, you know, time goes on, and that's the life of my thing, you know. Thank you.